Hello, my friend. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so glad that you're with us. I really am. I, I pray that God will speak to your heart. He'll touch your life through the message that I want to share with you today. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4. 2 Samuel chapter 11, follow along as we read verses 1 through 4. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, and David, he remained in Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah? I, I want to talk to you for the next few moments on the subject, the downside of success. The downside of success. Now, understand, being successful, it's not wrong. It's not at all wrong. Um, and don't limit uh, your definition of success at, uh, into a financial realm. Don't, don't make success only about money. There's many ways that we can be successful in life. But we need to be aware there are two potential downsides, two potential liabilities that come with success. The first one is this, your hearing dulls. Your hearing dulls. It's hard to hear people you deem to be less, success, less successful than, than you are. So your hearing dulls, but also your eyesight dims. It's hard to focus on people that you deem yourself to be more important than they are. You don't hear them. You don't see them. You just think you're too far above them. Well, that's kind of where David is in, in our text. Um, as a matter of fact, David's never been higher. I mean, he's, he's at the pinnacle right now. He's incredibly successful. Israel is expanding and prospering. In two decades on the throne, David has distinguished himself as a king, as a warrior, as a statesman, as a musician, a poet, and a psalmist. His national boundaries have expanded to 60,000 square miles. Now that's 96,560 square kilometers. And he suffered no defeats on the battlefield, not a single defeat. He's loved by his people. He's served by his army, and he's followed by the crowds. He is at an all-time high. Actually, life couldn't be any better for David than it is at this moment. Now, on this night, referenced in our text, David is standing on the palace balcony overlooking the city of Jerusalem below him. Now, let me stop the story just for a moment. David shouldn't have been out on his balcony. Oh, it was his. He had every right to walk on it, but not this night. See, David shouldn't even have been in Jerusalem at all. He should have been out on the, the battlefield with, with his army. That's what kings did when uh, the weather turned to spring. That's what they did in the springtime. Kings went out to, with their army to do battle against their enemies. But David chose to stay in Jerusalem and not go out. So he shouldn't have even been there. And as a result of this, he is going to make a huge mistake in his life. See, it's, it's springtime in Israel, as we said a moment ago. The days are pretty warm, but the nights are refreshingly cool. Now, on this, on this night, he's walking in the cool of the evening out on his balcony, and he sees a young woman bathing in a nearby courtyard, and he's captured by her beauty. 
I mean, he's taken with her beauty. So he sends a servant to find out about her, to inquire of her, find out what her story is. And, and the servant returns with the information that David is seeking, but, but he weaves a warning into his report to David. He tells David her name. He tells David her marital status, and he even tells him the name of her husband. It's recorded in verse 3. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah? Well, why would the servant tell David that she's married if not to caution him? Why would, she, why would the servant tell David the name of her husband unless David was familiar with it? And odds are, David knew Uriah. But he ignores the servant's warning. He blows right through it and, and he issues another order. Bring her to me now. In verse 4, Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her and she returned to her house. It wasn't long. Soon after this encounter, Bathsheba sends word back to David, she's pregnant. Oh my, when David heard those words, it was like a slap across his face. This complicates everything. This complicates everything. And, and, and he said, they're going to discover my sin of adultery. And so he looks for a way, he connives to find a way to cover up his sin of adultery. And in the process, he's going to tell lie after lie after lie. <clears throat> and he's going to end up commissioning Uriah's death, committing murder. He's just as guilty as anyone in Uriah's murder. Now, in this story, you'll notice David does a lot of sending. He does a lot of sending. He sends in verse 1, he sends Joab out to battle. In verse 3, he sends a servant to inquire about Bathsheba. In verse 4, he sends for Bathsheba to come to him. In verse 6, he sends word to Joab to send Uriah back to Jerusalem. In verse 8 and 9, he sends Uriah to Bathsheba to sleep with her. His plan was if, if Uriah sleeps with his wife and when her pregnancy is discovered, he'll just assume that the child is his and everything will be fine. My sin will be covered. But Uriah didn't do it. He didn't go to sleep with Bathsheba. He was too honorable. He, he, he didn't think it was right that he should enjoy a night of pleasure with his wife when his fellow soldiers were sleeping in jeopardy alone on the ground at the battlefront. So he chooses to sleep somewhere else. And when David discovers that Uriah did not go to Bathsheba, he's running out of options, at least in his mind. And so... He sends, in verse 14, he sends Uriah back to the battlefront with a note, a sealed note, to Joab. And when Joab opened the note, this is what it said. Make sure Uriah dies in battle. What arrogance. How arrogant can David be? And, and truth be told... This arrogant David is not the David that we prefer. We, we prefer David the, the statesman, David the warrior, David the giant killer, David the musician, the poet, the psalmist, the sweet singer of Israel worshiping God. That's the one we prefer. And truth be told, we're not comfortable with the David who's yielded to his weakness. I mean, we, we don't think of that in him. See, his success, David's success, has weakened his judgment, not to mention his morals. Weakened his judgment and his morals. And like I, I said at the very beginning, here's the liabilities. His hearing has dulled. He can't hear like he used to. He can't hear the warnings of a servant. He can't hear the voice of his own conscience when God has stirred it. And not only has his hearing dulled, his eyesight 
has dimmed. He can't see like he used to see. He didn't see Bathsheba as a married woman who would be off limits to him. He didn't see Bathsheba as the wife of a man that he knew, the wife of Uriah. No, he, he saw Bathsheba as an object of desire, as a conquest. You know, let's pause our story again just for a moment. If we're honest, now we hate to admit this, what I'm about to say, but if we're honest, we also can identify with this arrogant David. Now be honest, we can, because we've been known to overestimate ourselves at times as well. I read this story of a very well-known pastor. He tells the story about a time when he lost his own judgment and became pridefully arrogant. Here's what he said. He said he was on a cross-country flight and he was becoming increasingly irritated with one of the stewardesses, stewardesses, the one that was assigned to his section. She just couldn't do anything right. He asked for a soda she brought him juice. He asked for a pillow. She brought him a blanket, if she brought him anything at all. And the pastor said, he said he began to grumble within himself about the lousy service, and, and he started wondering, I wonder if she even knows who I am. I mean, people have told him all the time what an honor and a privilege it is just to, to be in his presence, just to get the to able to hear him speak. Well, the more mistakes the stewardess made, the more arrogant his thoughts became. I'm famous. I'm wealthy. I deserve better service and treatment than this. Look, it's your job to serve, and it's my job to be served. He said that just when he didn't think he could take one more mistake, I mean, if she made another one, he was going to tell her off. Just when he didn't think he could tolerate one more mistake, she approached him with a question. She leaned down and said softly, I I'm so sorry to bother you, but are you pastor so? And she called his name. And when he said yes, her eyes filled up with tears and they began to spill out and, and run down her cheek. And this is what she told him. She said, divorce papers were served on me this morning. And I had been, I, I tried to call my husband, but he won't take my calls. I, I've left message after message after message, but he won't return my calls. And to be honest, Pastor, I, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't even know where I'm going to live. And, and it's so bad I, I can't even focus on my job. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I am making a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes. And then she asked him, Pastor, would you pray for me? And he did. He prayed for her. And, and then here's what he said. He said he spent the rest of the flight repenting before God for his prideful arrogance. Wow, what a story. True story. Well, let me ask you, how's your hearing these days? How's your hearing? Are you able to hear the people that the Lord is sending your way? It's no accident that they come. The Lord sends them. Are you able to hear them? Can you still hear the voice of your own conscience when God stirs it and says, stop? And while I'm asking, how's your vision? How's your eyesight? Do you still see people as people? Or do you merely see them as how they can serve your needs. Do, do you see people who need you? Or do you merely see them as someone that is so far beneath you 
you don't have the time to bother with them. How's your vision? How's your hearing? You know, if you look at the story of, of David and Bathsheba, immediately, I mean, it's been couched as a story of adultery and lust and murder and lies. And, and, and it is, it is that. But you know what? <clears throat> if we're honest with the text, it could be that it's more of a story about pride and arrogance. It's a story about a man who rose too high in his own eyes for his own good. It's a story of a man who desperately needed someone to tell him, David, come down before you fall down. See, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 and 19, listen to this. Pride goes before destruction. Notice he didn't say pride goes before a bump in the road. It goes before destruction. And, and it says, it goes on to say, and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Notice he didn't say an arrogant spirit before a stumble, before a fall. Better to be of a, a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. That's the scripture. My friend, listen, this is why, this verse, the consequences of pride and arrogance, this is why God hates arrogance. Because he hates to see his children fall. And he knows if they're prideful, they're arrogant. A fall is in their path. It's coming. It's not if it comes, it's just when. That's why he hates it. He hates to see his Davids rise up with arrogance. And he hates to see his Bathshebas victimized. He hates what arrogance and pride does to his children. See, pride is focused on and only concerned about who is right. And they'll fight you for it. But humility, on the other hand, is concerned and focused on what is right. What is right? Listen, listen to Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13, Proverbs 8, 13. If you respect the Lord, if you respect the Lord, you will also hate evil. Goes on to say, I hate pride and bragging evil ways and lies. If you respect the Lord, you'll hate evil. Hmm. Proverbs 16 and verse 5, listen to this. The Lord hates those who are proud. They will surely be punished. Wow. David, full of pride and arrogance, and he, he makes a horrible mistake. He doesn't listen to the voice of his conscience. He blows past the warning of a servant that tried to warn him, don't do this, but he did it anyway. And he ended up telling repeated lies, and he ended up, might as well say he committed murder because he was that much of a participant in it. And you know what, my friend, those of us who are familiar with David's story, with the rest of David's story, we know David never fully recovers from this episode in his life. This time, this episode with, with Bathsheba, he never fully recovers. He's going to pay for this for the rest of his days. Nathan, the prophet, told him that's what's going to happen. And it did. He never fully recovers from this episode in his life. What about us? What about you? What about me? How can we avoid becoming prideful and arrogant? I mean, it's so easy to let pride slip in. It's so easy to become arrogant. It's so easy to see yourself above and beyond everybody else. It's easy. And I'm not telling you something you don't already know. You know that. So how do we avoid becoming prideful and arrogant? Well, there's a number of things that are mentioned throughout Scripture that we can do to avoid becoming prideful and arrogant. But let me just mention one. Let me just talk to you about one. Here it is. Resist pride, pursue humility, 
and embrace an honest perspective of yourself. Listen to that again. Resist pride, pursue humility, and embrace an honest perspective of yourself. Understand, humility doesn't mean you think less of yourself. It doesn't mean that you put yourself down and demean yourself. No, not at all. Humility means you just think about yourself less often. Listen to what Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, Paul writing to the young church at Rome, and, and he says, don't think you're better than you really are. Wow. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Don't think you're better than anybody else. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your perspective, uh, perspective of yourself. You know, it, it, regardless of how successful you may become, in the big picture, we're all equal. Let me explain. We're all equal. You see, we were born with nothing. We were born with nothing. And, and when we die, we're going to take nothing with us. Not a single thing. Doesn't matter how successful we've been. Uh, listen to what Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 15 says. People come into this world with nothing. And when they die, they leave with nothing. Listen to this. In spite of all of their hard work, they leave just as they came. We are born with nothing. We leave with nothing. We leave just as we came. Doesn't matter how successful you are. You're not taking any of it with you. You're going to leave it here for your heirs and, or somebody's going to get it. And you don't know what they're going to do with it. Maybe it's totally different than what you were doing with it. But you're, you're not taking it with you. I don't care how high you reach. I don't care how successful you become. You're not taking anything with you when you die. God has a cure for the high and mighty, for the proud and the arrogant. He has a cure. He lets them fall back into reality. He lets them fall back into reality. And you know what, my friend? That's not a bad thing. Because see, when God lets them fall back into reality, they'll be amazed at how their hearing improves. They'll be amazed at how their vision will clear up. And, and they'll be amazed at how much less complicated their life becomes. God has a cure. You get proudful, you get high and mighty, and God will let you fall. He'll let you fall for your benefit so you can get your hearing back, so you can get your vision back, so you can live an uncomplicated life. You know, throughout the Bible, there are passages of Scripture that tell us what God wants from us, what he expects from us, what he requires of us, a number of places. And one such passage is found in the Old Testament. It's found in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Listen to the, it's Micah chapter 6 verse 8. Listen, he has shown you a man what is good and what does the Lord require of you? And then he names three things. Do justly. Love mercy and walk humbly before your God. It's not a suggestion. The passage says this is what God requires of you. It's not a, oh, I hope you, I hope you do these things. No, it's this is what God requires of us. He requires it. He named three things. Do justly. That simply means this. It means that you live your life within the, the boundaries and the parameters of God's word. You live right before God and you live right before men. Do justly. Do what's right in every case. Then he said, love mercy. Be merciful. Merciful and kindness kind of go together. You know, if you get filled up with pride and you become arrogant, mercy's not such 
seen very much in your life, I mean, if at all. The proud and the arrogant, they're not all that merciful. They're, you're going to pay. But God said, I require you to be merciful. Even when you're the one that's been wronged, be merciful to the one that's wronged you. Be kind. Be kind to the people that are in your life. And then he said, walk humbly before God. Walk humbly before God. In other words, resist pride. Resist becoming arrogant. It doesn't matter how successful you have become. Resist pride and arrogance. Be humble. Be, have an honest assessment of yourself, an honest perspective of yourself, and walk humbly before God. In other words, live your life with the realization it's not about you. It's not all about you. Do justly. Live right before God and live right before men. Love mercy. Extend it to those that are in your life, especially those who've offended you, have wronged you. Be kind to the people around you and walk humbly with your God. Remember, it's not all about you. <clears throat> Let me pray for you. My Father, I come to you in Jesus' name and I bring my friends with me. And Lord, you know, I mean, you know our thoughts and the intents of our heart. You know the words on our tongue before we ever say them. We can say we're not proud or arrogant, but you're going to know whether we're telling the truth or not. And it's so easy, it's so easy to, to gain success in this area of our life or that area of our life and, and to let pride kind of creep in. And when it does, our hearing dulls and our eyesight dims. And we don't walk as close to you as we should. Father, I pray that you'll deal with each one of us when it comes to this avoiding pride and arrogance. You hate what it does to us. We need to hate it too. Hate it enough to protect our hearts from it. My father, some of my friends are going through some very difficult times right now. And they're crying out to you for your intervention, for your help. I, I pray that you'll be very close to them. Make them, them aware of how close you really are. I pray, Father, that you'll do for them what needs to be done. I pray, Lord, that you'll do in and through them what they cannot do for themselves. And I thank you for loving us like you do. I thank you for being faithful to keep your promises to us. I thank you for meeting my friends at the point of their need. And I offer you my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for listening to this week's message. To stay up to date, please like us on Facebook at Touching Africa Ministries or visit our website at touchingafricaministries.org. If you would like to give online, head to touchingafricaministries.org slash donate.